Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters here on France 24. I'm Marc Owen. Sixty years ago, the French government and representatives of the main Algerian Nationalist Party signed the end of the Algerian War. The so-called Evian Accords marked the end of the eight-year-long brutal conflict and led to the independence of Algeria, yet peace was still far from achieved. There were terror attacks from French extremists who refused to recognize this independence. Thousands of Aki, the Algerians who served in the French security forces, were left behind. Many were massacred. And thousands of Europeans who lived in Algeria fled to France. Karim Yayawi with George Yazbek and Nezrin Benzabouchi tell this story, a crucial chapter of French and Algerian history. An opulent building on the peaceful shores of Lake Geneva. This private home used to be the Hôtel du Parc. There's no plaque or sign, but this place marked a decisive chapter in Franco-Algerian history. À Evian, sous les fenêtres de l'Hôtel du Parc, la tempête du lac s'est apaisée. Symbole peut-être. Et tour à tour, Belkacem Krim et la délégation FLN Louis Jox et la délégation française se sont encore une fois retrouvés, mais cette fois pour conclure. Peace at last. After seven and a half years of a cruel and interminable war, yet many had hoped that it would end long before. The pivotal date in this story for France is 1959, the 16th of September 1959, when de Gaulle says on television that we will move towards self-determination. Je m'engage à consulter les Algériens dans leurs douze départements au sujet du destin qu'ils veulent adopter. Et ça that was understood at the time as a march towards independence. I lived in Algeria as a child when my father was sent there as a teacher. Later, I was a second lieutenant there during the war. And on the 16th September 1959, we thought the war was over. But of course, the Evian negotiations only began to bear fruit in the spring of 1962. Pierre Jacques' father, Louis Jacques, was at the head of the French delegation that negotiated the Evian Accords. But between General de Gaulle's declaration and the ceasefire, the war intensified. Between 1959 and 1961, General Charles' plan was to impose French military power against the National Liberation Army. But the question is, could de Gaulle really have precipitated peace? He couldn't have. Look at how he came to power. It was with the support of the generals, in the name of French Algeria. If he had adopted that position then, there would have been a putsch in France. Negotiations continued all the same, against the backdrop of extreme violence. The French army was having some military success, but politically, the Algerian war was becoming increasingly difficult to defend. In 1961, in Evian, not far from the Swiss border, a new round of negotiations raised fresh hopes. The FLN found in Switzerland, with its reputation for neutrality, a suitable base for discussions with the French authorities. My name is André Gazou. And I arrived in Switzerland in 1960 in a rather particular way. Because I had just deserted. André Gazou ran away from the French army, horrified by the torture carried out. He sought refuge in Switzerland, where he found a job in television news. In 1961, I managed to be admitted to Bois d'Avaux, where the GPRA delegation was based. They had arrived in a Swiss airplane from Tunis and were staying on this Bois d'Avaux site, which was guarded by the Swiss Army with anti-aircraft artillery out of fear of being bombed by a small OAS plane. L'OAS, bien sûr. And you have to remember 
le, le, le that the mayor of Evian had, had just been assassinated by the people of French Algeria. L'enquête se poursuit pour tenter de retrouver les auteurs de l'attentat d'Evian qui coûta la vie au maire de la ville, M. Camille Blanc, et blessa légèrement sa femme. Les enquêteurs examinent actuellement les quelques pièces du dossier, lettres de menaces de toutes sortes expédiées presque toutes d'Algérie. Et donc, moi, je me suis retrouvé... So, I found myself on Monday, the 5th of June, at Bois d'Avou. It was quite incredible to find myself in front of negotiators. There was a feeling of happiness that perhaps this war will end. Alas, those first Evian negotiations ended inconclusively. My name is Yves Roland Bilker, and at the time I was at the Ministry of Algerian Affairs, the head of which was Louis Jox. Evian took place in several phases. At the first one, Krim Belkacem had imposed two red lines, the unity of the people who were opposed to the creation of a special status for the Pieds Noirs, and also the territory's unity, dismembering Algeria by depriving it of its Saharan departments was out of the question. The first Evian didn't work out, though, because we clung to those departments. And then, as soon as it failed, there was the putsch. The prospect of an independent Algeria was unimaginable for some officers of the French army. In April 1961, they attempted to overthrow the Gaullist government. L'armée vous parle. Vous avez devant vous les généraux Chal, Jouot et Zeller. Le 13 mai, l'armée française avait fait le serment solennel de garder l'Algérie dans la souveraineté française. Ce serment Nous venons aujourd'hui, au nom de l'armée, vous le renouveler. The putschists never managed to mobilize the soldiers. They all had radios and they were listening to what was being said in Paris. And they heard the calls from the general to resist the putsch. So the putsch failed. Then the general calls us in. He begins by telling us, Algeria is a box of grief. But do you have an opinion on the future of the negotiations? I replied, yes, I have something to say. The Algerians will never give up the Sahara. They need sovereignty over it, and if you don't give them that, it won't work. I was pleasantly surprised to hear the press conference he gave a few days later, in which he would say, we never believed the Algerians would one day give up their claim to the Sahara. We're prepared to recognize it, but we need guarantees. The agreement on the Sahara unlocked negotiations, but they seemed likely to stall once again, even as the General de Gaulle put pressure on his negotiators. The ceasefire was signed the 18th of March, and came into force on the 19th at midnight. Algeria was born in forceps. It wasn't a simple transfer of sovereignty like what happened in Tunisia or Morocco. It was very difficult for us. The Algerians also won a fundamental battle in their eyes. There would be no special status for Europeans. They wanted to give a million Europeans Algerian citizenship while letting them keep French citizenship. It would have created a state within a state. So we refused. A referendum on self-determination was organized within three months. An Algeria which guaranteed the equal rights of citizens would see the day. La perspective qui s'ouvre sur l'avènement d'une Algérie indépendante, coopérant étroitement avec nous, satisfont la raison de la France. France obtained the concession of the Mers El Kebir military base for 15 years and was allowed to continue its nuclear experiments in the Sahara until 1966. As for the country's immense oil reserves, Algeria could have them 
but France would continue to manage them for several years. The day of the accord signing came as an immense relief for France. Oh, je suis bien content d'un côté parce que je pars bientôt faire mon service militaire et je pense bien que ça terminer. Je pense une chose que c'était la, la, la seule des choses qu'on devait faire. Eh bien, c'est un cauchemar qui se termine quoi depuis le temps que ça a duré depuis sept ans, hein, c'était un peu long. C'est un bien, c'est un mal. Pourquoi J'ai ma famille qui est en Algérie. Vous avez votre famille en Algérie Oui, monsieur. Et vous craignez pour elle Moi, je crains pour eux, oui, monsieur. The fear of the Gaullist government at the time was that the war would start again. So de Gaulle encouraged his representatives in these negotiations to give in as quickly as possible, without any real compensation, but without taking the time and without giving them the means to build a proper Algerian state. The FLN, meanwhile, urged caution. A ceasefire isn't quite the same as peace, and to prove the point, it was followed by violence from the OAS. Then, when the accords were signed, there was an unprecedented upsurge of violence in Algeria. Attacks and assassinations by the far-right OAS paramilitary group increased. The FLN retaliated with murders and kidnappings. OAS commandos confronted the French army in a deadly urban guerrilla war. Déjà à Oran, attaqués par des commandos OAS, les troupes ripostaient. Dans les rues étroites, on tirait des terrasses sur les CRS qui établissaient leur quadrillage. On dénombrait trois morts, on comptait 66 blessés. On the 26th of March, a pro-OAS demonstration boiled over at the entrance to the Babelwed district. It left dozens of people dead and became a turning point in the minds of many Pieds-Noirs, the name given to Europeans living in Algeria. The French army was shooting at French people. So the Pieds-Noirs took it as proof that the OAS was right when they said, pack your suitcases or you'll end up in a coffin. The Accords promised a multicultural Algeria, but during this transition period, between May and June 1962, hundreds of thousands of French citizens left the country. In June, the FLN and the OAS finally signed an agreement that was quickly broken. And the Pienoir exodus continued unabated in spite of the FLN's call. Algériens d'origine européenne, au nom de tous vos frères algériens, je vous dis que si vous le voulez, les portes de l'avenir s'ouvrent à vous comme à nous. Notre peuple, dans sa sagesse, a supporté tant d'épreuves que ce soir, que demain, cesse les dernières violences. But it wasn't to be. The violence continued even on Independence Day. The referendum planned by the Evian Accords was a formality. More than 99% of voters chose independence. But on the 5th of July, in Iran, the national holiday was interrupted. Shots were fired and panic ensued. The OAS was suspected to be behind it. Au cœur de la cité, alors que l'excitation battait son plein, une fusillade avait éclaté. Une fusillade qui a fait près de 100 morts et plus de 150 blessés parmi les deux communautés. Following the gunfight, the violence escalated. Numerous Europeans were lynched. France also left behind tens of thousands of Arki. Algerians who fought with the French army, the colonizer, and were seen as traitors by the FLN. They voluntarily left them behind. Nowadays, some say abandoned. And those they repatriated to France, they put in camps. Why? Because they didn't trust them. The general gave orders to jocks not to allow the Harkis on board. He said, these Harkis will make a mess of things in France. I don't want them back. My name is Flou Mohamed Areski. Mohamed Flouy thought he'd be safe to stay in Algeria. But then he spent six years in prison 
before managing to reach France. I believed in the Evian Accords. I believed that it was guaranteed. For example, I thought that if I came to France, I had the right to bring my wife and children with me, but not my mother or brothers and sisters. So I said to myself, 19th of March, maybe it'll be all right. I'll stay. But on the 22nd of July 1962, everyone was thrown into prison. Most of them died. De Gaulle abandoned the Arkies. It was he who sent us to death row. The Avignon Accords marked the end of the Algerian war, but they weren't recognized by the future Algerian government, nor by the military, who saw in them the persistence of colonialism. For the French, they were simply a means of exiting a war, which had become far too unpopular. Here are the Evian agreements. There are seven or eight pages. It was a magnificent project that could have come into force in the 40s, 50s, maybe even the 60s. But it was spoiled by hesitation, backtracking and crimes on both sides. The Algerians won their independence. And Algeria's youth was full of hope for the birth of the new nation. As for the multicultural society promised in the Evian Accords, it only ever existed on a few pages of a document in which nobody really believed. That report by Karim Yahawi, George Jasbek and Nezreen Benzabushi. You can see it again, of course, on our website, france24.com. This is Reporters. Thank you for watching. Stay with us, but most of all, stay safe.